Hey, welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. Oh, that's going to be the mark. Coming up on the Best of Any Live, Jay Estes from the Orion Flight Test Office. And Rachel McCauley, the LAS Attitude Control Motor League. And 30 mile an hour winds that nearly destroyed my receding hairline. Very windy out here, actually, at White Sands. Uh, very exciting day. We're going to see Pat the uh, Orion Paddleboard one launch, test launch today. And uh, boy, conditions are tough. Hey, they're very tough because it's very windy out here. We had the wind blowing directly in our face. So please bear with us. You can see the uh, Orion and launch port system right there on pad. Absolutely. And, and in about less than an hour, that's going to that, be launching. So we're very excited today. And uh, Jay Estes, who's the uh, deputy uh, project manager for, at the Orion Flight Test Office, we had a chance to speak with him a couple weeks ago. So uh, let's go to Jay and let's learn exactly what's going to happen today in less than an hour. Now, what's going to happen once that paddleboard one takes off? Well, it's going to get out of here really fast. That capsule underneath has got about three rocket motors stacked on top. The one nearest to it, right above the adapter cone, we call the abort motor, and that's the motor that lifts the entire vehicle up off the pad and gets it out of here really fast. It'll get going about Mach 0.6 in about three seconds. Wow. Above that is two other motors. There's a jettison motor and an attitude control motor. About 10 seconds after it gets off the pad, that motor's been firing all along, but it begins a, a tip over, a reorientation of the capsule. And it continues to tip over until the attitude control motor uh, burns out. It'll actually reorient the capsule, turn it around, get the heat shield forward. And then that jettison motor, the four little nozzles, they'll fire and they pull the whole tower off the capsule. And at that point, the four bay cover uh, is going to fire two little chutes out and then it's going to be shoved away by some thrusters and once that's out of the way there'll be two drogue chutes that come out that are going to stabilize the capsule and get it heat shield forward about five seconds after that those two chutes are cut loose and then three pilot chutes are fired these are small chutes that are actually going to pull big parachutes out okay. and take the bags off oh wonderful now that's a mile up and then a mile down for this test that's right that vehicle right now is loaded with about 692 different sensors that are going to measure temperature speed sound stress in the vehicle it's going to tell us a whole lot about the environment the main thing we're worried about is that abort motor uh, it produces about 500,000 pounds of thrust right off the pad. This thing actually gets about 17 G's right off the pad. Oh, wow. One of the reasons we keep the motor cool is to keep that acceleration down a little bit. Okay. But all those sensors are going to tell us the acoustics that the capsule is going to feel. We fired one of those statically on the ground, and it told us a lot. It actually scared us a little bit because it was actually a little louder than we might thought, a little more acoustics. All the critical systems on board have got to also survive, and so you need to know how the acoustics are on the outside. This test will give us a basis, and then we'll know um, what to design to for the production vehicle. You know, the cool thing that I like about this particular Paddleboard 1 test is that this abort system is unlike any abort system we've ever tested in, ever. That's right. We so, had, one, we so had one for Saturn, but that was more of a passive system. It was passive. It was very similar though. In fact, it looked much like this. If you look at it, the big abort motor nozzles that we have on top of the abort motor, we call them reverse flow. That's a new technology. Okay. The Apollo capsule had a big truss structure underneath with the nozzles down there. And the truss structure was simply to get those nozzles away from the capsule. Okay. Uh, but it didn't have the active control. And uh, the thing that that does for us, when they went with the passive design on Apollo, there were black zones in the abort scenario. Uh, with that active control up there, uh, we can cover all those black zones and we can actually save weight too because in order to keep a passive system stable you had to add a bunch of ballast up there. Now what do you mean by black zones? Black zones would mean aborts where you're not sure that you can complete the maneuver gotcha, successfully gotcha. and save the crew. So a black zone is something you have to avoid. Now you've, you've been working on this project for several years now. Yeah, about four and a half years. How, what's, what's the feeling you have right now? You're, you're getting ready to launch and it's, it's about to go off any, any minute now? And Yeah, the, the feeling is finally. I mean, we, we had to work through a lot of things, a lot of challenges. Everything you see out here, that gantry, the pad, the vehicle, and our integration facility over here, we put all that in place. We had to have all that in order to pull this off out here. And, you know, it took us a long time to, to get the vehicle designed and agree what levels we had to design it to. Uh, right now, there's no data for this thing, so our vehicle's designed to be very sturdy. It's a right. battleship design. 
you know, frankly, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what parts will survive and what won't because we don't know the, the environment exactly. Right. Well, Jay, uh, you, you've done a great job over the past four and a half years in following you on this project, and uh, we look forward to launch. And yeah, we'll thanks. It's going to be great. Take us through the attitude control motor because that's the motor that's going to be providing the direction for the, for the abort system, right? Um, yes. So there's, I guess, two main functions. The first function is that we provide um, provide gas. That is the energy that we use to control the um, ACM. And we have a control system that controls the thrust. And that's the real challenge on the ACM is controlling thrust. So this is a first for NASA to be using a solid rocket motor with these valves in this configuration. We've never um, used it in flight like this. This is cutting edge technology at, at its best. Now this is all new technology. What historic what information from the past have you used to create this new technology? Um, well, ATK has used their um, expertise that they have had um, with some DoD um, rockets on controlling the thrust. Um, we've used the control system on other types of um, systems before, um, and using gas generators is not something to new to NASA. So we've kind of had pieces from different um, from different areas, but the um, the key is putting it all together. The system in itself is very complex. Okay. Yeah, what were some of the challenges over the past uh, couple years? One of the main things that we have been focusing on is the valve. It's very hard to get a valve to have that much flow that long of a period with that high of a temp. You have to get some special materials to be able to handle that and it's been really hard to find the right materials and the right geometry to be able to handle those loads. What are the plans after today? After today is to start getting ready for um, the production system. We have a lot of work to do that we've recognized with PA1. It was a great pathfinder helping us find some issues that we didn't expect and some issues that we knew were coming. We just had a, an opportunity to work some of those things out. Are we using the same type of solid propellant for each, all the three motors? No, we're no. not. No? Okay, so each one has its own separate characteristics. It's yeah, own. its own recipes. So. Yeah, it's own recipes. <laughs> well, you, you get a sense of the complexity of, of this kind of system when you hear that. It, not only three different motors, three different types of fuel, or every, it's just very complex. I bet you Rachel's the one, she's in the, she's in the, uh, in the oven turning yeah. it. With, 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 with the mixture. I'm, I'm going to need some more fuel over here. That's right. Set up that, yeah. Now there's some really good guys do that work. I'm not as precise as that, I'm sure. They, they do a really good job. Coming up next on Any Live. A gaggle of engineers. And two aspiring astronauts, CC and Kira. Wait, a gaggle? What do you call a group of engineers? Pride? And the important motor is the, the motor on the bottom of the stack. It's just above the crew module. And it accelerates with the vehicle from zero to 450 miles an hour in two and a half seconds. What the launch abort system would do is, is pull the crew capsule away in the event of any kind of emergency on the pad and, and pull them away to safety. There's a lot of power out there. That motor, that abort motor, has the equivalent power of about 25 top fuel dragsters, which is, that's pretty powerful. And if you could somehow turn that power into electrical energy, it could power 13,000 houses for an entire day. 13,000 houses for an entire day out of a two second that's, burn. That's right, it's it's a half a million pounds of thrust. Guys, do you hear that? Did you say 13,000 houses, Franklin? 13,000 houses for a uh, power for one day off of a two second burn. That's incredible. I think the good news is it's going to be quieter than what was happening outside my hotel room last night. <laughs> <laughs> Now, for those of you who don't rem remember Amanda, Amanda was our mass properties engineer that we interviewed, geez, must have been a couple it's years ago, right? a couple ago, years right? ago. It's at least two years it ago. It was on our yeah. NEAT segment on the Orion flight test order. That's right. Yeah. So what have you been doing since then? Still doing mass properties. So we've done, you know, more integration. Dryden did a lot of integration of the avionics, a lot of the CPAS system, the acoustic blankets, the ballast is installed right. now. So we had to track everything as it's going along. And, you know, our whole team has done a really good job from everything to get the stack up of that launch abort vehicle back and, there. And, and it's your responsibility to make sure that that vehicle weighs the right amount. That's right. Not just me. I have a whole team here. Okay. But okay. yes, in the end, I'm the lead signing the endorsement for we're good. Your title is very interesting and I'm going to let you roll with that. PA1 Deputy Integration Lead. Okay, what does that mean? We work with all the different teams. We've got companies across the country, one in every time zone. And so we kind of make sure that everybody's talking to each other and getting the ball moving, making sure we become one big team. It was a challenge, but we got there. That's been a common theme mm -hmm. throughout all these interviews you've had, that it's been all this integration. Well, 
if all this integration is so difficult, why, why is it so spread out? Why do we spread it across so many entities? Because it seems like a massive challenge. It is a massive challenge, but by having a dispersed team, you can pull on expertise and talents all across the country to come together to build this amazing vehicle and what it's about to do. So what are some of the uh, difficulties in uh, putting that vehicle together? Well, not everything fits the way you always want it to, so making it all fit was, was a bit of a challenge at times. But Now you're just doing it sections at a time? or Yeah, we start with mating the Bort motor to the jettison motor, and then okay. we attach the adapter cone and then work forward from there. Now how long does that process take to, to really put that all together? Well, we've been out here for about a year. Wow. So, so has it been a lot of fun? It's been a blast. It's been a lot of hard work, but it's been really rewarding and it's great to see her up. Well, is there the possibility that maybe we could have a crew flying in this vehicle during this test? Not this test. Oh. Okay. We'll have some goodies, but we won't have any. And now, seriously, you're an engineer, so from your perspective, what would it take from this, from this standpoint to make it flight ready for someone like me? We need a lot more, and there's no cushion <laughs> in it right now, so, oh, so, so uh, like there's a, a lot. Maybe an air mattress or two yeah, or something you, like that? And a bunny suit, a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well be wrapped up in some foam. Yeah, well, if, if I'm going to make an impact, what a way to do it, right? Yep. And the one thing that I'm noticing, Wayne, is you have the coolest outfit I've seen anyone wear out here so far at uh, White Sands. W what exactly do you do that you get to wear this cool suit? Well, actually, I'm um, going to do the aerial observations on board the helicopter. So after the vehicle does its flight and the pieces land in the desert, we'll get in the helicopter, launch it, orbit over the pieces and then assess what we're looking at as far as a scenario of condition of the items, identify if there's any hazards so we can release the recovery team and they can come out and pick up all the pieces. Now if you recall uh, when we first talked a couple years ago, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we looked at the mass properties of that flight test article, you know, Blair was actually in the crew module when he flew from Langley to Dryden. Chris, tell me you did not leave the hangar. I wish I could remember Morse code. I think he's still in there. I'm right here. Oh gosh, that's how. What are we going to do about that? Because that's not going to be good for the recovery. Team. Hey, if you if, if you know where Blair's at, hey, please let us know because um, we just don't want him to be a goner. So let's let's good luck on the test. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back to NASA Edge. We're live at White Sands Missile Range. And wait, wait, hold on. Yeah, it's still windy. <laughs> yeah. In case you couldn't tell. I had to literally take a knee to talk to my next guest, uh, Cece, whose mom works on the uh, uh, Paddleboard Project. Um, Cece, how old are you? Six. And is this your first launch? Oh, when I would say no. I'm. Yeah. No. What kind of launch have you been to before? A shuttle, and that, the shuttle was my first. What did your mom tell you about, you know, what's going to happen today? Um, she said it was going to be really cool and... You can't wait to see it, huh? <laughs> I can't wait to see it. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. You want to be an engineer like your mom? I've been thinking about it. Your aunt works on this project. What did she tell you you are going to see today? Oh, uh, some of my aunt's what she worked on in her test and all that. Okay, so we, we're gonna, that, that the uh, paddleboard test is going to go off. We're going to see uh, it, it rise up into the air and the parachutes come out. You're excited about seeing that? Yeah. I got a question for you. Uh, ask her, Carrie, if she wants to be a future NASA Edge uh, co-host. I have a question from Chris. He wants to know if you want to be a future NASA Edge co-host. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She's undecided. Hey, hey, Franklin, you'll still have to take a knee <laughs> when you shoot with me. <laughs> You're in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. What's that entail? So pretty much everything that happens on the vehicle, there's a group of mechanics and technicians, so they do the integration. Um, I'm in charge of making sure that goes every day, making sure that the procedures like people talked about, the work orders, all the coordination for that happens and is in place. We have the right people on site, right. and we get the vehicle integrated and ready to fly. Uh, what's some of the challenges that you faced over the past several years in working on this? Uh, I think you're going to hear this all over the place. It's coordination. It's a huge project. A lot of people, a lot of personalities. It's just not easy to bring them all together. Things change day to day. The project changes, the, the engineering changes, 
and it's, it's just always a challenge to bring it together and get it on the vehicle and something that's ready to fly. Now we have a flight day coming up, right? So uh, what are you going to be looking on uh, on the day of flight? What's going to be your role? Uh, day of flight will be primarily getting the, getting the pad ready to go for flight. So. Uh, we start, you saw today, we almost ended up with a big thermal protective cover on the last uh, okay. and make sure we get that off, make sure we get the sensors ready to go, clear the pad, make sure it's, it's organized and ready to fly, there's nothing on it, and then we go in and uh, we'll sit through the, sit through the mission, um, listen to that just like everybody else out here will be, and then when it lands out in the field, about a mile down range, we'll go get it. Now what kind of, what kind of temperatures do you say, I mean, if we're out here in the desert, but what kind of, what's the temperature range here between day and night? Uh, about 30 degrees temperature range. The hottest day in May is going to be about 99. On deck, we have a Q&A session with Lori Grindle and Brent Cobley. And of course, the big launch. Not going to spoil it for anybody, but I hope it's a big success. Well, we are T-minus four minutes. We're less than four minutes away from launch. Uh, how how excited, excited are you guys? Pretty excited. What? It's been a long road. There's been a lot of people work a lot of years on this project. Yeah, I mean, what's it feel? I mean, to finally see this launch, and it, it's only a minute and 40 seconds, correct? Right, but it's behind me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just must be a, you know, you work for so many years on a project to see for just a short amount of time, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's important data that you're collecting out of this. Yeah, where Lori and I work at Dryden Flight Research Center, we, most of our work is surrounding airplanes. And so, you typically, we get a lot of flights, we get a lot more feedback on whether our experiments are working or not. Right. And when you have to wait four years for a 90 second flight, it creates a lot of anxiety. So, right. uh, we're certainly anxious to see this, this go, you know, go well. Whatever companies design systems that take humans into orbit, they're going to need some kind of abort capability. So I think that this technology will transition to other companies in the future, um, although their, their designs may be slightly different. I think a lot of companies will benefit from it. But the cool thing about this design is this is state-of-the-art technology that we're seeing today. Absolutely, yeah. There's there's several things about this, this system that are sort of improvements over what we did during the Apollo era, and you know all of them together really give us the uh, the extra benefit to try to protect the astronauts during the ascent. So White Sands is a very special uh, place. It's a, it's a special uh, facility in the United States for doing rocket testing. They have a range here that runs 100 miles long by 40 miles wide. So you can do these rocket tests in a really safe environment. And if the rockets should steer off course, in some cases, the longer rockets, they'll actually blow them up and make sure they stay within the range. In our case, our rocket doesn't have enough energy to leave the range, so it's safe to be here. The other reason we selected this is not this paddleboard test we probably could have done in many different places. But the follow-on test, the ascent abort test, actually we're going to fly the vehicle up to above 100,000 feet and do aborts as if we were in traveling to orbit. Uh, those, those tests need a much bigger range, and so that's the reason that really that White Sands was selected here. And so the question though about uh, if there's any risk to the public, basically they've chosen this area for us uh, based on a lot of analysis, a, a really a lot of analysis that tells us um, how far the last can go if anything happens at all. And so this uh, four mile uh, uh, radius is, uh, is a clear zone, and so we're all safe right here, and so is everyone on the base. What we've been, you know, hearing while we've been sitting here is that uh, we're still a, a go for launch. So, in spite of uh, the wind that we're experiencing here, it's the wind really at the launch site that matters. There's two two types of wind that we're worried about: the wind on the ground, the surface winds, and the winds aloft. And so, those are the two areas of, of most uh, concern, I guess, for us. Um, but in both cases, we're still a go for launch. So, in spite of the wind we're experiencing, we're still in, in good shape. Well, we were really worried about the surface winds for this set here earlier yeah. today because yeah. uh, <laughs> if you were here at three o'clock this morning. It was, it was pretty bad. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, with the status of the uh, Constellation program, why are we still doing this test, or why is this test still important? Okay. Is that one mine? Yeah. If you want, well, yeah, you sure. start it and I'll okay. jump in. Well, I was going to say that I think it picks right up on the answer that Brent gave to his very first question um, about you know applying, uh, uh, giving the data out to uh, to the commercial public and everything. Uh, basically, we always will need this information unless we want to to just uh, be satisfied here on the Earth and not do any exploration of any kind or. Uh, you know, we're going to need to know uh, this kind of information and have this kind of data. It uh, will enhance our technologies and, and all of that. And so, uh, independent of Constellation's uh, status, I think the information is good, the, the flight data is good, and, and will help us uh, for our future. So, is, I mean, is it fair to say if, can if Constellation hadn't been canceled, the technology is still, it's always useful. Whether, whether a program's going on or not or whatever, we still need the data to absolutely. move forward techno technologically. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably a fair way to say is we're sort of 
potentially delaying some of the human exploration, but we're not, we're certainly not ending it. So, right. you, know, that, you know, the technology, we need to advance this and it's, it's, now's the right time. We're ready to go. This, this test has been planned for quite a long time. You certainly wouldn't want to have stopped this test because yeah. we were ready to go. You guys ready? Yeah. yeah, this is great. This is, is going to be cool. You see a live look at the pad? I'm so nervous. Wow, Launch Complex 32E at White Sands. It's amazing. It's a beautiful uh, backdrop there. The skyline's beautiful. I can't believe we're actually this close to launch. <laughs> <laughs> this, this kind of reminds me of the Ares 1X flight uh, test that we saw back at Kennedy. Three, two, one, one, T minus one, one minute. minute. Wow. T minus one minute. Franklin, can you believe it? Man, this is this is great. This I'm is the first for me, you know? Yeah, I'm, it's the first for all of us for this. This is yeah. incredible. Well, you know what? I, I haven't even seen a shuttle launch yet. Well, I haven't I, seen a shuttle no, launch. I haven't seen a shuttle oh, well, we'll have to make sure that happens. Yeah. So, so Aries 1X well, was we, my first. We'll be down for the last shuttle launch for the launch show. Absolutely. Yeah, Three, two, one. Oh, man, this is so cool. Even Brent's getting excited right now. I'm so glad I have this platform <laughs> to stand on. Yeah. I've never seen Brent so nervous in my entire life. I mean, look at him, he's shaking. And I'll echo T minus 10 seconds on my mark. Mark. Five, four, three, two, one. Launch, launch, launch. Wow. It's not descending. It's the the winds are carrying it. You sure you're not in that capsule right now? <laughs> <laughs> Little CEV hang time. You know, and it was cool. The different stages. Everybody yeah. that the, you know, they're you reacting know to different. Yeah, yeah. Re re reacting at the different times. And yeah, it just landed. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Let's go back. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. Nice. Wow. I, I, I'm still kind of stunned, actually. <laughs> Even still, they're still congratulating each other. That's right. Yeah, yeah. They all know they played a role. Yep. Well, this uh, broadcast has come to an end. Uh, we again want to thank you, and you're watching NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. NASA. A little, little stereo action <laughs> there. That was nice.